Dr. Markham, thank you so much for joining us on Empowered Kids TV today. I am honored and really grateful to have you share your wisdom and your insights with all of us. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. One of the things that is a bit of a conflict for me, when I was growing up, I had one younger brother and we were eight years apart. And now I have two boys that are 20 months apart. And the dynamics are very, very, very different. Um, and there have been times when I found the constant bickering, comparing and competing was very much unique to my home until I started to talk to other parents. Right. And then I realized that sibling rivalry is as commonplace as toddler tantrums. Mm -hmm. So today what I wanted to explore was what's at the root of sibling rivalry um are there any benefits that we should be grateful for as parents <laughs> <laughs> i see you're the kind of person who's always looking for the silver lining I, am. <laughs> I love it uh and then as parents how can we sort of guide our kids away from the constant comparing and competing to more of a, a spirit of teamwork so with that in mind right. i'd like to start by asking if you can help us understand what's at the root of sibling rivalry well, I think at the very root of sibling rivalry is survival. It's a survival instinct. So if you think about it, Nicole, you've only got two hands. And your boys, if, if a tiger jumped out of the bushes, they both want you to be grabbing them, right? And so when you look at scarce resources, human beings are all geared for survival. We can be generous. <laughs> and, you know, the research that's been done on empathy shows that we have some genes for empathy. And we can, some people are really have a hard time being empathic. There aren't very many of those. And then there are a few Mother Teresas who will be empathic no matter what. But mo most of us can empathize with other people as long as we're not worried about getting what we need. Right? And so when you look at it, your boys are worried about getting what they need from mom because there's only one mom. And that's not a tragic circumstance, in fact, because in our day and age, both of your boys are going to be fine with whatever resources you have to give them, right? Um, and, you know, there are no, you know, there used to be families with 15 children in them. That's not the case anymore, right? So, in fact, Yes, there's, there's less need for the sibling rivalry for the scarce resources, but humans pretty easily get threatened and move into fight, flight, or freeze. And when that happens, our, somebody looks like the enemy, and it's usually our sibling. Uh, are there things, common things that you could identify that we do as parents that may unintentionally trigger the emotions that foster sibling rivalry? Sure. Well you can assume those emotions will be there, right? You can assume that every child's going to sometime look at, I'm thinking of the first child born, look at that baby and say, they talk this baby up, but this is really not all it's cracked up to be. In fact, this baby is ruining my life. This baby is always crying, is always on mom's lap. Whenever I need something from her, she says, just a minute. Like, wait a minute, what happened here? What happened to me? You know, what about me? And that's a very normal human reaction. And so what, when our child has that reaction, if we can accept that emotion, and we can help our child to feel like, you know what? Everybody feels that way. That's how all big brothers and sisters feel. And it's not the only thing they feel. They also love their little brother or sister, right? And it's complicated. That's the way life is. You know, you can feel more than one way about your sibling. When kids get that kind of response from us, um, then they, when we allow the emotion, then they can resolve it, they don't feel like a bad person, and they can move on, and they can learn to love their sibling. Um, they can get used to the presence of their sibling. But when we shut down the emotion, then it gets stuffed, and then it's no longer under conscious control, and it can burst out. And that's not very pretty when that happens. <laughs> so that's the thing we do most that gets in our children's way. But also, as kids get older, often we, we will compare our children you know, why can't you do what I say quickly the way that Johnny does? Well, you know, that's not helpful. That If you're saying that to little Michael, little Michael's thinking, well, if you love Johnny so much, go be Johnny's mother, you know. And it's not helpful to either of them, actually, or to the relationship. Um, and then we often unwittingly set up competition. Like, well, which one of you can get dressed first so we can leave, you know. We all 
what exactly? We've all been there, right? And it's like, bite your tongue. Not a good thing to do, you know, uh, which we can talk more about later about how you create teamwork, as you said. And then I'd say the final thing, not the final thing, but another thing that we do often is we blame instead of looking for solutions. So we say, well, who did this? Who made this mess? And in a culture of blame like that, you can bet, you know, little Johnny's saying, it's Michael's fault, you know. You talked about validating emotions, and that really stood out for me because maybe two or three years ago, I found myself practicing parenting techniques that allowed me to be great at validating happy emotions. So I was good at saying, oh, you're so happy, you're excited, you're feeling proud. And I found multiple ways to have them express those. But that didn't extend to the kind of dark emotions. When it came to anger or frustration or even pain, I used every distraction technique I could think of. Um, You're okay, you're a big boy, you're strong. Or no need to cry, You're, you're a strong boy, boys don't cry. And... Thankfully, you've taught me that as parents, we should really be striving to validate all of our kids' emotions. So if we focused on that today and we looked at anger and frustration, are there ways that we can help our kids be able to express that in an effective way and also in a way that's not geared to hurt each other? Yes. So I'm so glad that you brought this up because I'm betting you that Every parent who's watching this right now is a fantastic parent when he or she is not triggered. And what happens to us when our children have negative emotions is we get triggered. We, it's like we move into fight, flight, or freeze. It's an emergency. All of a sudden, we're, we're, we're so, you know, oh, my gosh, my child is feeling this thing. So if it's pain, of course, we love them. We want to stop the pain. If it's anger, we want to shut that anger down because anger is scary to us. All of us were once small children around adults who sometimes got angry. And we all carry with us that legacy of being terrified of people's anger. And so when our child feels a negative emotion, we go into a state of emergency. So the most important thing we can do, most important thing is, and our, really I think it's our number one responsibility as parents, we can regulate ourselves. And that means, it doesn't mean stuffing your feelings because that'll give you a heart attack. It means, it means noticing your feelings and breathing deeply and not acting on them. You know, when you're angry, you feel this urgent need. I have to do something right now. I have to act on this. I have to teach that kid a lesson. I have to, you know. And the truth is that's your anger speaking, right? That's you've moved into fight, flight, or freeze, and somebody looks like the enemy, right? And you need to take care of things. But actually, stop. Notice, wow, I am so angry, right? Notice, breathe, take a deep breath. Pay attention to the sensations. My hands are clenched. My throat is tight. I feel this like a vice grip on my chest, you know, whatever it is. And breathe. If you just notice and say the sensation and you breathe through it, what will happen is that the anger will dissipate a little bit. And then you can make a wiser choice and you can also respond to your child's emotions, not from a place of emergency, right? So that's the first thing to do when our children have big feelings like anger. Um, And then we're modeling appropriate anger management. So we can act, that's the second thing that's so important. If we're trying to teach our kids to express their anger without hurting each other, we need to not be hurting, right? So we have, instead of I'll teach you to hit your brother or whack, you know. We need to be, right, we need to be taking a deep breath and saying, whoa, 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 let's everybody calm down here, right? We're teaching appropriate anger management. We can say, you are so mad. And many parents I know that I've worked with will say, they started saying to themselves, it's not an emergency. And they started saying it to their children because it just would come out of their mouth. And the children now will say it to each other. It's not an emergency, they'll say. It's so great because it calms everybody down, right? Because we thought it was an emergency. For just a minute there, we were sliding off the deep end, you know? Exactly, exactly. So if we can stop and go, whoa, whoa, let's everybody calm down. Now, you are so mad. Let's everybody calm down. And, of course, setting limits, no hurting, right? And teaching our kids to set those limits with each other. So that we say to our child, 
Are you having fun? You were roughhousing a minute ago, but now you guys look pretty mad. No, I'm going to get him. You know, he hurt me, and I'm going to hurt him back, you know. And then you have to say, okay, whoa, whoa, stop. You can use your words. Say, don't hurt my body. Say, stop. Say, no. When somebody says stop, we stop. You know, there are little mantras that you can teach kids. When, when you say stop, you mean stop. And we're teaching kids about body boundaries. And this is really important for little kids to get because, you know, kids often play in a fairly rough way and they love it, but they need to be able, which is great. It's a great thing to do, but they need to be able to say, they need to feel safe in that play, which means when they say stop, they mean stop. And when, the, when one of them doesn't stop, you can say to the other one, Kevin, did you hear your brother said stop? I heard him say stop. Kevin, what do you need to do? And you can walk right in between them and put a hand, you know, like this, you know, so you're or hand around both of them and pull them apart, whatever you need to do. To, and you're teaching them how to do this with each other, right? And you're also teaching them by this kind of a discussion that anger is the body's response to being threatened. It's the body going into fight, flight, or freeze. That's what it is. So, well, what's threatening us? You know, sometimes we feel scared. Sometimes we feel hurt. Sometimes we feel powerless, right? What is it that's threatening us? And so we can say to our son, if he's fighting with our other son, you know, you are so mad. I think it really hurt your body when he pushed you down. And it probably hurt your feelings too. Can you say that? Can you tell your brother, that hurt my body. That hurt my feelings. Don't push me, right? And if we give kids words, they don't have to use their fists. Yeah, and I think that's that's exactly it. We've been really good at giving them words for the other emotions. Oh, you're so happy. You look so excited. But we haven't really extended that to the emotions that scare us the most. Yes. So, yeah, so we yes. run away from it. And so we've not given them the opportunity to learn words to express those emotions. Yes, and in fact, we there's research on siblings that if the mother talks to the older child when they're little... You know, even a toddler, now your kids are very close in age, but so you could talk to your 20-month-old when the baby's born, for instance, and you could say, hmm, I wonder what the baby's feeling. Oh, he's crying. I wonder what he needs. What could we do to make him feel better? Oh, I think he was hungry. Oh, he needed his pacifier. You figured it out. You know just what he needs sometimes. What a great big brother. He's so lucky to have you as his brother. You know, that kind of conversation, not only... Does it make the brother feel like, well, I have a role to play here that's important. I can play a positive role with my brother. But it also helps the older child to begin to think of the baby as a person. Can't talk to him. Doesn't look like a person. You know, it looks like a doll or something. Uh, but actually, he's apparently this baby has thoughts and feelings. Who knew? And so what the research shows is that when we do that with our child right from the start, by the time this, the baby is a year old, even though they're still not very, very verbal, right, at a year old, the older child is nicer to them. They're kinder to them because they see them as a real human being. Right, with their own set of emotions and their own set exactly. of needs. Exactly. And, of course, you're doing your older child a huge favor, too, because you're helping your older child to develop emotional intelligence. They're learning how to see what somebody else is feeling, how to resonate with somebody else. So the, the basics of emotional intelligence are being able to calm yourself down, right? Which we're modeling for them as we yes, do these things. We're trying. We're, we're, trying. we're <laughs> trying to model calm for them, yes. And, and how to soothe themselves. Every time we soothe them, they're learning to soothe themselves. So when they get anxious, hopefully... For the rest of their life, they're going to take a test. They're going to ask a girl on a date. They're going to apply for a job. Whatever it is, they can calm themselves and soothe themselves. Because when they got anxious, we calmed them and soothed them when they were babies, hopefully, or when they were toddlers, or both. Um, so those are the basics for how we deal with ourselves. So how we teach our child to, you know, manage their own emotions, essentially. But then there's the other part of how do you understand someone else's emotions. So as we talk to our children about what they think their sibling is feeling. And we can do it in a very, um, you know, we don't want to do it in a lectury way because then it's not interesting to them, right? Then they just shut down when you lecture. Now, you know you're better than that. Your brother has feelings too. That's not helpful. But if we say, hmm, 
I wonder, I wonder is the best thing. I wonder what he, he's feeling. I wonder what he's thinking. I wonder what he wants. Oh, look what happened. Oh, he loved that. Oh, I don't think he liked that when I did that, you know? It's, it's interesting that, that we're looking at, at the flip side. So I, I've managed me and now I'm looking to understand the other person. One of the things that I'm trying to figure out how to do is how to help my boys move away from the, I've won this argument, I was right, and to sort of move into a space of being able to respect that they are different and they will have differences of opinions over things, and then that's okay. Uh, do you have any guidance on how I can do that? Yes, of course. So, first of all, you want to minimize the times that there's competition, and I know that's hard to do, especially with boys and especially close in age. There's more competition. But you want to minimize that when possible. So when you know you're going to be getting into an elevator and somebody's going to want to push that button, you can negotiate it first. You can actually, and people say to me, doesn't this take a lot of time? And I say, less time than navigating the fallout, right? Yes. So I would say while you're in the car and you know you're going to the dentist's office and they have an elevator, I would say, hmm, do you remember that there's an elevator we're going to go in? Isn't that fun? Now, do you remember we have to push the button for the elevator? Hmm. So somebody gets to push the button going up for the floor and somebody else gets to push the button for the door to close. That's my fault. Black. The door closes. That's a good one, you know. Is this the, you know. And then on the way down, somebody gets to push for the floor and somebody gets to push for the door close. How are you going to decide who pushes the button? So you're sort of giving it to them as a skill to be worked out. You know, how do you do this? But you're there to help. You're driving the car. there, And immediately your brother's going to go, I can be one of the boys. What are your boys? Uh, Amari and Jelani. So Amari's the older one and Jelani's the younger. So Mari's going to say, I get to do it. And Jelani's going to say, I get to do it. And you can say, of course, you both get to do it. You both get to. So who gets to push the, on the way up and who gets to push on the way down? And, of course, the older one's going to be smart enough to figure out, oh, the way up is the first one, so I get to do that. And the, <laughs> the younger one might agree to the, you know, the other one because he doesn't understand it's a worse deal. But you can say, hmm, but, you know, the one who presses on the way up doesn't get to press the door close button. So that means if you're going to press on the way up, then you get to press the door close button, right? Great. Oh, that's so great. You guys want to shake? I mean, if they can reach each yes. other in the car, yes. you know, which you don't always want them to be able to do, but <laughs> if they can, if they can, you would say, okay, so you want to shake on that? Great. Okay. So I'm going to remember this. So-and-so on the way up, so-and-so on the way down, but you get to push the door close button when he does it, and you get to push the door close button on the way down. You know, you, so you get the agreement made. And then you're holding their hands, you're walking to the elevator, and you go, okay, who's going to press the door close button? It was you, right? Oh, yes. And who's going to press, you know. And so it's done. It's not even a, there's no winner, there's no loser. They worked it out. And you also say to them, I am so impressed with the way you two worked that out. Wow, you're such a good team. You're always able to figure out, not, you're, not always, because it's never, no one is 100%, but, you know, you're, you're so good at figuring out how, to, how everybody can be happy. Right? Because you're happy because you get to do this, and you're happy because you can do this, and I'm happy because you guys are happy. And as my son used to say, we're all happy now. <laughs> so you're basically transforming what would have been a competition and a winner into a, an opportunity to work something out and an opportunity to see themselves as people who are looking for win-win solutions, who are looking you know, to figure something out together and who are good at that, right? Um, I also think you can, and the more you're respecting the kids and the more you're listening, the more you're modeling and teaching them how to respect each other and how to listen to each other. That, you know, the, I just can't say enough about modeling. They learn from us. So, but you can help them if they're getting stuck by saying, hmm, I hear Jelani saying, he wants so and such and such, but Mari's saying that he wants such and such. Hmm, what can we do to work this out? So you're, you're giving a voice, and you can say, well, so Mari has an idea about this. What do you think, Jelani? No, you don't like it because, huh? So what can we do to make this work for, for both of you? you know, so you're actually helping them to navigate that, and it's, it's a really important skill. I mean, how should they know this? You know, way back when we lived in tribal communities, children were not... Um, so separate from each other or from other families. So what happened was, and also I have to say, people 
um, because there was no birth control and because we nursed babies for longer, kids were more separated in age, but they had more cousins and more other kids of other ages. So what would happen, and there were, there, and also because we didn't have antibiotics, unfortunately, children didn't necessarily make it through childhood. So there were actually more adults to children. So all of that meant kids got taught more. They had older children and adults around to teach them more. So the two-year-old or the three-year-old is going to be on the hip of an eight-year-old girl who's carrying them around who's their cousin. And if mom's like done with the kid for now, the aunt's holding him, you know, there are always other people. And the, the older kids teach the younger ones these skills. So the, the eight-year-old would say to the three-year-old, no, you can't have that that way because everybody needs to have, this needs to work for everybody. You can't have the whole thing yourself, you know, and the three-year-old's like, oh, okay, because kids are actually primed, anthropologically speaking, evolutionarily speaking, they're primed to follow the children who are a little older and to take their guidance. And so they want to be like those kids because they in some ways identify more with older children than they do with us as adults. We seem like another species to them, right? So as a result, they would have learned things. Whereas in our culture, we just throw all the three-year-olds in a sandbox together and expect them to figure it out. How are they supposed to figure it out? There's no one showing them, right? So I think it's really important for parents to teach their children these skills. And as you do, it's amazing how children will actually begin to use your language and work things out with each other. From your example in the elevator, I realize subtly how I may actually be actually in introducing competition without meaning to. Um, because what, one of the things you said, and I heard myself think it, um, and then when your words were different, I was like, oh, when you said, who's going to press the button going up? And who's going to press the button going down? My mind was saying, who's going to press the button first? Oh, uh, my goodness. <laughs> so I can yes, see yes. that quite subtly, because once I've introduced the word first, someone's going to be first and then someone's not going to be first. That's right. That we might actually be, in little ways, not meaning to just be still in competition. And I mean, competition is a big thing in our home. My boys have taken the most mundane task. <laughs> Who can get into their PJs first? Who can brush their teeth the fastest? Get down the stairs the fastest? And it feels like it's consistent to the point where sometimes I've actually, to get them to be on the same team, I would say, okay, who's going to race mummy down the stairs? So you all work together as one team and you race, but it's still competition. It's still the energy of competition. And as you said, I've, I've tried to look for the silver lining. I've tried to say, well, maybe this is helping them to stretch themselves, to, to push themselves, to be more creative, to go faster. But I know there are negative, negative things about it. And I think because we're, we're so knee deep into the competition, I'm lost as to how to turn around and to come out of that mode of constant competition. Any advice? Yes, I would say really introduce the idea of teams. And, and everything that happens, focus on the team. So give them the feedback of what a great team and ask them about how they've helped each other. So if it's time to brush their teeth or time to get their PJs on and one of them is like, I did it first, right? You can say, wow, look at you, you have your PJs on. And then you can say to the other one, and look at you, you have your PJs on. Two boys with PJs on. Give me five. But mom, mom, I did it first. He's like, He's like you missed the yeah. point, right? And you go, you know what? You both did it. And that's what matters to me. And you know what would matter to me even more? Being the kind of brother who helps your brother. Did either of you help each other with this? No. But I bet sometimes you help each other because I remember yesterday you helped each other with blah, blah, blah. You know? Um, and so if you, you know, it's a value that you can instill. They're still, how old are they now? Five and seven. Five. Right. So they're still young enough that you can instill this value. So you can say, you know, um, what matters most to me is brothers who respect and care about each other and help each other out because that's the definition of being a brother to me. So I love that you both got your PJs on. I am so proud of you. I'm proud of how you focused on it and you did it. And you know what? You both did it quickly. So we have time for a book, two books. Two books because you both did it so quickly. I'm so excited. Well, let's pick books. Come on. So, so do you each want to pick a book since we get two books, or do you want to work together to pick two books? You know, and you can, like, 
So everything is about them deciding how much they're going to work together. They have a choice. They might say, no, I want to pick my book. And you say, okay, that's okay, because we have two books. Sometimes you work together. Sometimes you pick your own book. But we always help each other. So it's really your language, right? Okay, I can see that. <laughs> I can see that. One of the things that I've also done is I've trapped myself very deep into the trap of equality. Everything must be shared equally so that we don't have the argument of he got more than me. Um, and I feel trapped in that argument because there are times when obviously their individual needs are not equal. And I'd like to find a way to be able to, to provide for them based on their individual needs, but still leaving them both feeling fully loved, even though it doesn't look equal. Um, so now I'm trying to figure out how to t make the turn from, <laughs> from doing everything equal to being able to say, this was what you needed and it's slightly different to what your brother needed. So how do I... How Can you give me, an, give, give me an example of this? The, I think the silliest example comes when it comes to dinner time. My okay. seven-year-old can eat twice as much as my five-year-old, but they need to start off with a plate looking the same. Or it starts off, you gave him more food than you gave me, even though he knows his older brother can actually eat more than he can. And I've fallen into the trap of making sure, even though the older one will get a second serving, the first serving looks the same. <laughs> so but that's okay to do. It's, I think that's actually a good solution to give the older one the same, to just start everybody at the family off gets a, ba everyone in the family starts off with a basic serving. That seems perfectly reasonable. And then anyone who wants more gets more. And if you're, you're, you dish them out and your five-year-old says, he got more than me, you can say, oh, did you need more, sweetheart? Let me give you more, you know, um, right? Just like that. It's just, if you, oh, did you need more? Let me give you more, sweetie. There's plenty of food to go around. You know the great thing about our house? We always have enough food. We are so lucky that way. And, you know, of course, there's a reason for food being one of the places kids fight about this. It's love. Food symbolizes love to all of us. That's why we go eat a pint of ice cream when we're sad, right? So, you know, I think it's important to realize that you also have to look at not just dinner time, but the other 23 and a half hours a day. Does your child feel loved? And I think it's critical that we're responding to our child's needs at any given point and not lumping the kids together. Like, I know in a, in a family where there's two boys, often people say the boys, as if they're the same person, the boys. Well, they're not. They're not the same person. They're separate people. So, right, to, to say their names is actually an important thing to do when you refer to them. Um, and when your child comes to you, nothing should be in reference to his brother. It shouldn't be, um, you're getting big, soon you'll be big like your brother and able to kick the soccer ball. It's more like, wow, I saw how you were kicking the soccer ball today. You're really, really getting that down where it's, it's a hard thing to get coordinated. When I used to kick soccer balls when I was your age, I fell over all the time. I am so impressed with, you know, don't compare him to, your brother, to his brother. If anything, you can compare him to you and how you fell down. But he's going to look, a five-year-old looks at his brother and thinks, I'll never be like that. Uh, he's perfect. And I remember my daughter, she's four years younger than her brother. So she, I remember her looking at him once when she was about five. And she looked at him and she said, Eli, when I'm nine and I'm older than you, <laughs> right, right? it never occurred to her that he was going to keep growing up too, right? And when she got that, she was devastated. Like, she would never outgrow him. So... I think it's important, they're going to compare themselves, but it's important for us, whenever possible, that it's not about any comparison to the brother, you know what I'm saying, or the sister. So if your child needs new shoes, and you know only one of the kids needs new shoes, the other one did not outgrow their shoes, you, and you know what's coming, you know they're going to get jealous, you would say, let's talk about clothes for school. We're going to, school is going to be starting soon, and we're going to need new clothes for the things you've outgrown. So we need to go in your rooms and try things on, and let's, let's write down who needs what. So even though you know one of them has tight shoes because you've been putting them on and they're tight, you know. Um, and so when he tries on his shoes, you can go, okay, so, you know, this boy needs new shoes. Mari needs new shoes. And then you would say, Jelani, your shoes are fine. That's great. But it looks to me like maybe you could use some new pajamas. You know, even if he hasn't outgrown his 
his shirt. He hasn't outgrown his pants. You can't say, sorry, you don't get anything. You can say, hmm, I wonder, you know, your underwear is a little worn out or you're, you need another pair of pajamas. Do you think you'd like superhero pajamas? You know, you, and so then he doesn't feel like, oh, my brother gets things. But it, it's different according to you're being very clear about it. We don't just buy shoes. We buy shoes according to your needs. You know what I'm saying? So at least they're getting that message. But I still would be careful of your brother gets 10 things because he grew a 10 inches, you know, and you get nothing because you're a shrimp and you didn't grow, you know. <laughs> that leads us into what for me is an observation that sort of fills me with fear, if I'm honest. Um, from talking to a lot of adults, what seems to fuel sibling rivalry all the way into adulthood is the feeling that one child was somehow loved more than the other and as a parent I can honestly say it's I don't feel like it's possible to ever have a feeling that I can love one more than the other but because I've been speaking to a lot of adults and it seems to be a very common thread even among siblings that didn't have a lot of rivalry as kids if you ask them a lot of people somehow feel that one child was loved more than the other especially when you start to get to three and four siblings in a family and I and I have the thought of as a parent is this something that we can actually avoid or is this just part of the process of childhood that as parents we can't avoid I think we can avoid it and I think we have an obligation to avoid it I actually think we can and we have an obligation. And I think there was a time when parents didn't avoid it and didn't think they could. And they would just say things like, you know, I, I just saw this Meryl Street movie, August Osage County, and she says to one of the kids, you know, you were always your father's favorite. You broke his heart when you left. And the kid says, the grown woman with her own daughter, teenage daughter, says, I would like to think that my parents loved all their children. And she says, that's just not ever true. Get over it. And I felt like, well, maybe there was a generation that felt like that, but I don't feel like that. I don't feel that's um, ever okay, actually, because every human being who's born, I believe, has the right to have the blessing of their parents' love and adoration and for exactly who they are. And who they are is going to be different than their sibling. So it's certainly true that sometimes you'll be closer to one child than another. No question. I've been closer to my son. When he was younger, I was closer to him than I was to my daughter when she was younger. But then, you know, in high school, I was much closer to my daughter than to my son when he was in high school, right? So she's 18 now. So, you know, I think you'll be closer to one than another at different times. Um, and certainly, one can get on your nerves more than the other <laughs> at certain times. And if you have, by the luck of the draw, if you have a particularly difficult child, and there are, I really believe that about 60% of all kids are somewhere in the range of relatively easy to, you know, normally easy. You know what I'm saying? And those kids will basically be fine no matter how you parent them. You can't beat them, but you can't, you can't, you can't abuse them. But what you, but you can do pretty much ever, anything and they'll come out basically okay, right? But then that leaves a huge number of kids in the 40% who are not like that. So what about those kids? They have a risk factor of something or another. Maybe they were born super sensitive. Maybe they were born with sensory processing issues. Maybe they were born with a tendency to hyperactivity. Maybe they were born with some executive function issues that make it hard for them to focus. Um, maybe they are born more impulsive. And, you know, maybe they're born with a very high activity level. And those are the kids who are more likely to fight with their siblings. They're the ones who drive the parents crazy, you know. So definitely... There are a bunch of kids who are harder to parent, no question about it. And if you have an easy kid and a hard kid, you're going to find that it's so much easier to deal with your easy kid that you're going to feel like they're your favorite because the hard kid is just so hard, he drives me crazy. But the truth is that hard kid deserves just as much love as the easy kid. And he deserves it for who he is because he's not just hard. He's hard for you at this moment. Maybe he's just very strong-willed and he's going to grow up to be a real doer in the world and make great things happen, right? And he's difficult for you now, but that doesn't mean that he's not going to achieve great things in his life. But he's only going to achieve those great things if you're able to see the good points. So I would challenge every parent, and I know there are parents who feel that they feel some secret shame 
that they love one child more than another. I want to be really clear here. I'm not out to shame anybody. I have a challenge for those parents. Here's my challenge. If you have more than one child and you feel like you favor one of your children more than another, I'd like you to look at your relationship with the one you don't favor. I'd like you to, first of all, sit down in the privacy of your own room, light a candle, open a journal, don't label the top of the page where anyone can understand what you're writing about if anyone should ever find it, and just write all the good things about that child. And there will be good things about that child if you look, no matter how crazy they drive you. Really get clarity about that, and then come up with three things that you're going to do to strengthen your relationship with your child. You should be, could be, spending time every single day with each child, and it transforms the relationship. You could be looking for the positive, reframing things for the positive, understanding maybe there's a goodness of fit issue. Maybe you're really a quiet person who grew up in a quiet home, and your kid bounces off the walls, and it drives you crazy. That's, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your child. It means it's a bad fit, right? And so to find ways to channel your child's energy, to find ways to get a break so you can be a better parent to your child. All, just to, basically, I'm suggesting if you feel like you don't love one of your kids as much as another, take matters into your own hands. It doesn't have to be that way. You may always have a better fit with one child and feel automatically closer, but that doesn't mean you can't adore every one of your children equally. And so I would challenge you to try to connect and do whatever repair work you need to do so that you can really treasure your children, each one of them, because they deserve that. And don't compare them even in your own mind. You know, to say, oh, if only he'd be like his brother, is not helping anyone. And by the way, the favorite kid doesn't, you know, some people say to me, oh, I tell each of them they're the favorite. Well, actually, if you, that gives them, that makes them guilty. They feel terrible for their sibling. It's bad for the sibling relationship. And they sometimes wonder if they can trust you if you do that. Like, what are you telling their sibling? So it's never a good idea. What you tell each of your children is, I could never love anyone more than I love you. I think the conversation around siblings wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about rules. And there's sort of... There's a duality. There's rules that are sort of self-imposed and then there's rules that we adopt because of external expectations. So to give an example, my, my youngest um, will get asked just about everyone we introduce him to will ask him, are you the cheeky one? To which he now proudly replies, yes I am, <laughs> with the biggest grin on his face. Um, and there's a part of that that's funny. And it's just a humorous conversation. And there's a part of it where I feel inside, like I don't want his, his self-image to be solely directed by external factors and expectations. Yes, If he's absolutely. going to be the cheeky one, that's because that's, that's who he is inside, as opposed to the fact that right, everyone's right. asked him that he's cheeky. And I also don't want them to adopt roles because it's the opposite of what the other has adopted, just so that they can stand out and be special. Right. And, and I'm not even sure if this is something as parents we should be focused on. Oh, yes. yes. And, and how do we go about just allowing our kids to be more inner directed and, and inner focused rather than looking for validation about who they should be from external sources? Well, we could talk for an hour about this, but let me try to condense it down to a few areas to look at. So the inner directed part, I would say, is about how we talk to them. So when our child says, look, mom, is my picture pretty? You don't say, oh, yes, what a beautiful picture. You say, hmm, wow, look at that. What do you think of it? You're acknowledging it, right? And if, you're, you know, if your kid is young enough, your kid will tell you what they think of it. If they're old enough and they're used to validation all the time, they'll go, mom, I asked you what you think of it, right? So, you know, in which case you can say, um, sweetheart, I love it when you paint. I love it. And I saw you work so hard on this. And I see you used a lot of blue. Tell me more about the painting. Right? So you're, you're, you're not really giving them a judgment. You're just giving them acknowledgement. A description, exactly. An acknowledgement of what that they worked on. I mean, someone said to me, 
in a talk I gave recently. Well, when you say you work so hard at it, aren't you raising somebody who's a workaholic? <laughs> um, and I would say you can't get away from values entirely, and you wouldn't want to. Everything we do, we're embodying values to our children. And hard work is a value, but hard work in the service of your own goals. Not hard work in the service of, to be a good person, I have to wear myself out, but more like, like when you want something, when you want to get good at something, the way you do it is you work at it. Isn't that wonderful? And when you do, you do get better at it. What did you learn from working on it that way? Huh, what did you notice getting different as you worked on it? You know, that's actually really important. So you notice we're asking the child a lot of questions. That's where the inner validation comes in. So I think for all kids, and in my book, Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids, the last chapter, it's my favorite chapter, is on mastery. And mastery is all about this. It's how can a human being be raised to make the most of their unique gifts and bring them into fruition in the world and contribute to the world and really blossom themselves, right? That's the point of life, or it's one of the points of life. Um, so I, I love this chapter because I haven't seen a lot of work putting this all together. And so what I did is I put different kinds of research together and I said, here's how you raise a child who can develop mastery, who can develop initiative, who can develop self-discipline, and who is self-referential. So there's in fact a dialogue, there's a script that says, when your child, it has a daughter going to her mom and saying, what do you think of my picture? And one mom answers in one way, and then the other mom answers in a different way, and you get to see the juxtaposition, which way is going to have the child come out of it feeling like, yeah, I want to go to some more painting, you know? I want to, I'm enjoying this, and this is fun and exciting, and I'm in charge of my own creative expression, and I can learn and do here. I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm I, I was going to say, an, it's about agency. It's about, it's all our own inner volition. So it's really the opposite of the child who, you know, learns from the feedback to listen to someone else. So when the teacher asks the question, they go, uh, seven, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. It says, seven. Yeah. And if they're wrong, if she says, no, it's not seven, how'd you get seven? The kid goes, I did it like this. And the teacher goes, oh, here's how you do it. And they go, oh, okay, I can do that next time. So, right? So they're okay. It's okay to make mistakes too, right? Yes. yes. Okay, so last question for us today. Wait, wait a minute. But, uh, what I missed in your question was the cheeky one, the roles. Yes. Okay, can I answer that? Yes, you can. Can I answer that? Yes, you can. yes. Okay. So first of all, I think it might be a little bit different in Great Britain. But in the United States, when you would say, are you cheeky, you mean, are you impudent? Are you a little a little bit um, rude almost? Ah, so no, in, in the UK, if someone says you're cheeky, you're sort of the, the smart one, the mischievous child. Uh -huh. uh, the one who likes to stir up a bit of trouble, but in a fun way. Okay, so he's not a bad kid. He's not, he's not rude. He's just, okay. So what, so what I think you could say when someone says, are you the cheeky one? I think what you can say is, I've got two cheeky, since it's, you think it's a good thing, I've got two cheeky ones. They're both so full of life. I am the luckiest mom in the world, right? You're, you got your arm around both of them. You're kissing both of them. And that's that. And that's the end of the discussion. And if he says, no, no, mom, I'm the cheeky one, you can say, really? I think you're both pretty cheeky. In fact, I think you're both pretty fantastic. And you just, you're basically not allowing that to stand as an unvarnished reality because it's not protecting your other child. No, because he started to, he's actually started to say, yes, he is the cheeky one. He's, he's been sort, and, and that means, I think, he's taken on the role of being more serious, which is mm -hmm. why I talked about just taking the opposite role because for me, they were both pretty cheeky. <laughs> In, in their own right, in different ways. Um, yes. But now you can see, um, if someone refers to, to his younger brother as cheeky, you can see him take on the persona of more of a serious young boy. I am going to pay attention. I'm not going to be bouncing off the walls as I usually am. <laughs> um, and that's something that, that I'd like to avoid. I'd like him to just be who he is because this is all exactly. authentic self. And so I would actually say that to him. I would even say it to him privately without his brother around. You know, when you were younger, you were just as cheeky as he is. 
And you know what? You can be as cheeky as you want. I love all the parts of you. I love the serious part of you, and I love the cheeky part of you. And you can be whoever you want. And then when you're out in public and somebody goes, are you the cheeky one? You could say, you know, they're both cheeky in different ways. Um, but they're both cheeky. I have my hands full sometimes, but you know what? I couldn't be happier, you know? Okay, perfect. Um, last question. And this is for us all as parents to be able to take small but immediate action in, in our lives today. If we okay. had to, in our homes, begin the process of helping our kids move away from the competing and complaining and more to a spirit of teamwork, what things should we start doing today within our homes? Well, the most important thing is actually to spend time with each of them separately. They really need to feel recognized individually because otherwise they'll constantly be competing to be recognized individually, right? So if you can spend a half an hour, this is ideal, with each child every day, and if you have to set the other child up with an audio book to listen to, you know, in another room or whatever you have to do, it's worth it because, and then just focus, pour your love into the, that child. And you can, if you're doing something with them, you can say, hmm, you really love the, to build with blocks or you really love these Legos. Look at that. Oh, I see what you're doing. Does it fly now? You know, you're, you're, you're actually recognizing them for what they're doing. And you're not saying, oh, let's put wings on it. Let's make it fly. You're not in charge. You're, they're in charge. You're just giving feedback. And if, if he says, you make one too, Mom, you can say, I just love to watch you. No, no, Mom, I want you to make one. Okay, I could make one. How do I do this? Right? And the kids, when kids feel seen and heard, they really don't need to compete with each other nearly as much. That's huge. Okay, so that's one thing. That's the most important thing you can do to reduce sibling rivalry. Um, the second thing we've already talked about, it's about emotions. When they have emotions, it's not an emergency. You need to stay calm, model that, and help them, and allow the emotions. Allow them. You are so mad at your brother. Once we, calm, once we all calm down, we'll work it out. And then you bring them together, and you help them to talk things through. If they know they're going to get that help to talk things through, and they learn how to do it, it really reduces the bad feelings. And if you can reduce the bad feelings, then the good feelings have a chance to win out because every sibling pair has some good feelings and some bad feelings because that's the way humans are. So if you can reduce the bad feelings by letting them talk about them and letting them express them in constructive ways. So if your son says, I hate him about your other son, you can say, it's, that's, hate is not a feeling. Hate is a position we take, right? You are so mad right now. You are so mad. You, can you want to talk to your brother and tell him how mad you are about this? You really didn't like it that he pushed you off the swing. You know, let's go tell him, right? And so then he's not getting stuck in hatred. But if you said, you know you don't hate your brother, that's not nice. Don't say things like that. Then he stores that hate up inside, and there's no chance they'll ever work as a team, right? Yeah, I can see that. Thank you so much, Dr. Markham. I mean, your your insights and, and your wisdom, as always, have been very powerful to me. And I know that all of our viewers would be able to take the steps to increase cooperation uh, and reduce the competition in their homes. So thank you very, very much for sharing with us today. Thank you, Nicole. Great to meet you. Bye-bye.